So usually I let the guests start wherever they want, but with you, I am going to say, Melissa, thank you so much for coming back. You were my second interview ever. Yeah. And it's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. And I definitely want to talk about what you're doing now with Open House right up front because I think it's so important and I love Open House so much. And you were actually the first person to ever show my artwork. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I want to oh thank you for that. Gosh. Vanessa, I remember. And that was such an you know, you're not the first person that I've had that experience with, with open house, where it's been an individual who's like, I don't, I, I don't make art. I can't say that I make art or had, or what people had told them and like just getting the opportunity in a safe space to show and be like, oh, everybody makes art. <laughs> like no matter who you are, you're doing something creative and then you went on to be such a cut up collage master yeah and you actually helped it. with that too because when we were roommates in 2013 I was going through a stressful moment and you just like put creative materials in my hands and you were like make art and that and I've been making art ever since so thank you for that too oh, that gives me chills that makes me feel so happy because I feel like as I'm kind of shifting gears in my career path, that's like the root of being an art therapist is who I am and who we are. You know what I mean? It's not the clinician and the title and the license. It's like, I was like, you need to get out of this cerebralness and you need to make something. Mm -hmm. um, because I remember what you were doing in your free time was writing a lot and reading a lot. So even your free time was like good, but it was so dense and yeah, like too everything was so heavy yeah yeah oh that makes me feel really happy um well I can jump into talking a little bit about open house um so you know for those who don't know it's a community arts initiative that I started like 12 years ago now it's 2010 um and it was just supposed to be an opportunity for artists emerging artists musicians, poets, dancers, you name it, to show their work to a community where it felt like you had an opportunity. Like in New York, especially, the gatekeepers of galleries and shows, and it's so hard to find a space. But it was also a really special time where we lived and when we lived here, where there was a lot of creatives that were just like, we're all in this random, like, not Bushwick, not Williamsburg, not Chelsea, just like random Sunset Park, South Slope, Brooklyn. Um, and so it was really just about an exhibition space, like just an alternative space. Like we all have places we live who's willing to open up their place so we can share in that kind of like salon style. And I feel like a lot of the work you do is kind of variations of that old school kind of salon style. Um, yeah, and so I think maybe like about five years in when I started getting more into my art therapy work, Open House branched out a little bit into classes. Um, I started working with Christina Donello and she was the assistant director um, and we did art and music, no, art and movement. Um, I mean, there was a lot of music involved in Open House. Every Open House show had musical um, artists as well. And that was a big part of it too, it being interdisciplinary, it being for everyone and it being for anyone who wants to like show up, show their stuff and share in space, even the guests having opportunities to interact. Um, and so when Christina and I started classes, we did a bunch of children's art and movement classes. And then I did some more art courses and then I did some wellness workshops. Um, I collaborated with New York Creative Arts Therapists and did the Real Art Therapists of New York coloring book and did some pop-up coloring bars through Open House. And then just, you know, life got really real and it, I needed a jobby job and it took up all my time and Open House has been on hiatus for maybe five years, maybe, or something like that. Um, still utilizing it as a platform to share other people's artwork, to share new and emerging projects, to share mental health resources. So it's still been social media alive a little bit. Um, 
But what I'm doing right now is I just finished my application to become a continued education provider um, in New York State for um, licensed creative arts therapists. And what brought that to mind was I, me kind of leaving teaching, leaving some of my roles as a clinician, but yet really loving the true value of creativity as a source of wellness and also loving teaching and, and sharing different tips with everyone. I think what I was noticing in the field of art therapy, in many different mental health fields, in academia, a lot of gatekeeping on of information. Um, so um, by opening up as a continued ed provider, I could provide courses that could be for licensed creative arts therapists to gain um, CECs, which you need anyways to maintain your licensure. Um, but often a lot of courses are expensive, they're kind of the same topics. Um, and what I've really noticed is that there's not a lot of arts-based opportunities to get continued education credits. Um, and so even within our field, so like um, in our nationwide certification as an art therapist, and then New York State's um, licensure for creative arts therapists, there's only one opportunity that's in the art realm um, to receive a continued education credit. Um, which is a juried exhibition. Mm -hmm. So I did a few of those. I did a couple of them with um, Pratt Institute um, in the creative art therapy department. But what I would like to do is continue to kind of highlight the art in art therapy. Um, and it's really unfortunate that there really is only, you can, you know, you could take many workshops and courses and classes and teach and write a journal article, um, get published, all these different things that offer you continued ed credits for your license. However, there's only one thing you can do um, that's on the art side and it has to be juried and judged. So that's also a little funky too, um, but I don't know a lot of organizations that dedicate their continued ed credits mm -hmm. towards that part, towards developing art shows for continued ed. So that's kind of what I'm rooted in and developing exhibitions, but I also um, have all these curriculums and have all this information. And if I'm not teaching the courses um, at a college level, I still wanna share that information. Um, I also want to hear different voices. Um, I also wanna hear more anti-oppressive practice, um, hear from BIPOC voices and amplifying them in the field. And, just try to bridge the gap with what I feel is missing from the continued ed credit opportunities um, and try to make it a little more fun and a little edgier and a little bit more like open houses style, which is kind of interactive, relaxed, creative, fun, art party-esque. Um, yeah, so, and I think you can identify too with having to get having to maintain your license, having to take certain courses um, or all the different things you do. And a lot of times it can be kind of status quo. I don't know if that's a feeling you get or like the same Absolutely. kind of offerings that are come around, but from different organizations. Um, and I also, Open House has always been a side project. It's always been a passion project. I never want it to be my full-time job because then I think it would change how it feels. And through that, I can have the opportunity of offering low cost courses because that's an issue too. It's really expensive to maintain your credentials, to maintain your license, to maintain your job. Um, so trying to think of holistically how it could be beneficial for everyone. And that's another way of gatekeeping, you know? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, Courses are expensive. There's been many times where I'm like, oh, I would love to learn about A, B, and C, but I don't have $100 to drop on this course right now. So ideally they'll be um, affordable. And if I have a guest presenter, the guest presenters will be paid um, because a lot of times too, when you're presenting, having been on the presenting side, you don't get paid. You get double the CEs. So you get the opportunity to get double the CEs, but you get zero money, especially at conferences. You could fly across the nation and get no money. You just get CEs. Um, so that's also something to thinking about how it could be equitable. 
No, I love it. And I love this trajectory because you've been putting on things like this even before open house. I remember when you were in Florida and you did some like art show in a moving van or something. Oh yeah, the U-Haul show in undergrad. I mean, I think <laughs> that's what started it all, right? Like having, I think also being an installation artist, ooh, one of the other cats just came in. Maybe he'll come up and make an appearance. Um, you need a space to show your work, right? And so if there, if it's hard to get a show or get a gallery, why not make your own? And there's also something about that too, about that being a part of the creative experience. I mean, a lot of also my research and my work as an art therapist has been about exhibitions as a therapeutic experience. So not even just the like showing, but what the process is to be a part of it, to put it together and what that does for you as well. Yeah, that could even be a great idea instead of like participating in a juried exhibition where you're being judged, your work is being judged. What if people could actually like create or curate these kinds of one off exhibitions and see what the process of that is like, you know, what that does yes. for them. Yes. And then I mean, once I get the certification and since I've since I was a continued ed provider, you might hear some meowing a little bit. Um in Pratt's creative arts therapy department, I kind of know the ropes of what you need for the paperwork and really what you need for the learning objectives, right? So making sure that the paperwork is right so that you are meeting the requirements for the state, but what are the ways we can kind of think of it alternatively, um, which is kind of like how you're expressing it. Um, and then also who are the judges, right? Like. It's painful to me that the only arts-based opportunity to get continued ed credits is judged. You have to be judged. It's not about being in a show, being in a performance, putting together a show. Um, but I can make programming where it could be a workshop about putting together a show. So you're getting credit and you're in the show. So kind of trying to toggle between the gray areas um, and still meet the um, requirements. So what do you need to be able to make that happen? So I'm raising, um, I'm doing a little fundraiser. I haven't really branched out into doing um, like a GoFundMe or an Indiegogo or anything like that. I do plan on doing that in August, actually. Um, I'm going up to Bethel Woods for the next two weeks and teaching at the Bethel Woods Art Center. And then I'll be back here in Brooklyn. And that's when I plan to start. Um, some more crowdsourcing. But right now I have been just doing a social media campaign on Open House Brooklyn's, it's Open House BK on Instagram and Facebook um, and just seeking donations towards the $900 application fee. Um, my application is done. I've already have experience recertifying uh, a college department. Um, so I know that my application, everything looks right. I'm a credentialed art therapist, so I can apply to be a provider, but basically there's this $900 fee. Um, and New York State's a little bit different than other states in that it's a little bit of a racket in that some states already across the board have different organizations that they um, deem appropriate to be able to um, give continued education credits. But with New York State, you have to apply. And so each organization has to apply specifically to be a provider for creative arts therapists and pay the $900 non-refundable fee. So right now I'm just working on a social media campaign. We've raised $375 so far in just two weeks, which is so very sweet. And a lot of it has been from other creative arts therapists and people who I plan to have as guests and do workshops. Um, so I'm just kind of starting really grassroots right now. Um, I think I will definitely make it there. And it was also something that I had to like really think about my own vulnerability. What does it mean to say, I have this background, I have the experience, I've done programming for over a decade, but I don't have the $900. And what does it mean to share that um, and share and open up to crowdsourcing? So. That was something that I reconciled with for a while. Like what, you know, what does that make me look like? Does that make me not look credible? Um, but I think I'm feeling in this 
world and climate today that I'm seeing more transparency and we need this transparency. We need to know how much things cost, how much people get paid. We need to see salaries. We need to like be able to work in a more equitable space. So I just was like, fuck it. I don't have $900, but I might have some people who want to support this that I also will have be a part of it. And I plan on, um, I've been working on my own um, little coloring book. So I'm also going to give everyone who contributes um, a free coloring book that I will send out with a little package of supplies just as a thank you. Um, and that will be coming out in September. Um, yeah, so it's and actually, it's actually kind of nice to speak this here um, and say this out loud because it's interesting to think about identity, money, status, right? Like where you think someone should be, where we think we should be at this point. I mean, I've been in the field for 14 years. I've worked in private practice. I've been a professor. I've been an assistant director and I don't have an extra 900 bucks. Um, so to be able to be honest about that and it's been really kind of making my heart smile to see how supportive people have been so far. Well, I am also sure that we will raise the $900. Oh, yeah. You do so many things for communities. Like last time you were on the podcast, you were raising funds and doing art sales to raise money for Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. Yes. And we raised $2,500 that went towards, I think I split it. One of it went towards um, New York Foundling. And no, yes, a Head Start program um, in Puerto Rico. So working with education and with children in Puerto Rico. And then the other went towards the Sato project, which is rescue dogs in Puerto Rico. Um, that is such, thank you for reminding me of that. I feel like sometimes too, and you wear many hats as well. We kind of keep going and sometimes we forget like, oh yeah, I've done this before. Um, so I appreciate that reflection. Yeah, and you do so many things for the community, and this will be yet another thing for the community, you know, that you're providing. Yeah, and I also just, you know, I feel like I have so many people in my world that have such beautiful things to share. So I not only want it to be educational opportunities for creative arts therapists, which would be dance therapists, drama, music, art, um, but also for anyone, right? So I would love for Jason Hoff, my best friend, I would love for him to do a writing workshop. I would love for Christina Danello to do um, movement or anything she was interested in, or um, her husband Doug to do music, or you to do anything you want, um, but also opening it up to just being a monthly educational workshop. So some of them will be strictly for CEs, but they'll also be open to everyone. So that's something that I'm passionate about too, with this idea of gatekeeping, I wanna, op or of not gatekeeping, I wanna open up these courses to anyone who's interested. So if you're an artist who wants to learn about the therapeutic uses of materials, why not? If you're a teacher who wants to learn about that or a social worker or anything, why should we be hoarding these special um, concepts? Absolutely. I love that as well. Um, I also love that Jason's doing cut-ups now too. <laughs> oh my goodness. What I mean, good cut-ups have taken over. You are, I mean, if you started a cult, it would be a cut-up. <laughs> I think, I think I have. <laughs> I think you have. As I, as I said that, I was like, I think it's already awesome. Yeah, Jason could have a chapter, uh, a chapter of the cult. <laughs> <laughs> totally his new book looks great and you did the cover art for his first book her second book love case was his first book ben book was his second book so beautiful i'm just gonna plug my best friend right now because it's so beautiful yeah Larry he's got it too, actually. It's so nice it's it's and it's also cool because he's writing it through the year of the pandemic and i think as I'm reading some of these things now, I'm thinking hey. about, yeah, oh, <laughs> Jason. Jason, we love you. <laughs> that will make him happy. Harsh Cravings by Jason Hoff. <laughs> I am. Um, 
I feel like what's cool as I've been piecing through it and he'll know I started from the back and he's like you're crazy and I'm like I am crazy I always start backwards um it's cool to read this now and think about how much has changed right like while we were thinking we're going through the biggest changes through 2020 and now it being 2022 and I'm like so much has changed and so much about what we were working towards has changed. And I think some of what really matters has gotten distilled. And I think that's also part of what brought me back to open house. Like got just so burnt out during the pandemic and just thinking, what do I even still like anymore? To be mm -hmm. honest, like what still brings me a sense of joy or a sense of excitement? And the list got very small, you know? So I think it's interesting to read this and be like, we survived a lot. We really survived a lot. No, it's and, and very not even true. collectively, but individually, I feel like everyone went through so many different like growth spurts and traumas. And then on top of the collective, it's like an onion of layers. Absolutely. And yeah, no, I feel the same way that if something doesn't make me excited or like give me that excitement, the dry feeling, then I'm just not going to do it because yeah, life is short and we don't know how long we right? have and why waste I mean, your time think... doing things that you think you should do because of that, yeah, like you said, like some sort of prestige or something like that. It's like, forget it. Who cares? The shoulds, a case of the shoulds. I feel like the shoulds really got thrown out the window. Um, <laughs> Fuck the shoulds. <laughs> right? Mm. Yes. Um, that's such a favorite thing that I love working with with clients too, is like, sounds like you have a case of the shoulds, <laughs> <laughs> um, or the, like the and over the butts. Like now I'm like, everything's and nothing is like, but what about this? But what about that? I'm like, no. And like, kind of just like, you know, leaving roles that I thought were kind of the make or break of my life um and it being like and they were killing me <laughs> by the way I'm wearing I found this so I moved into this new apartment like a year ago and I, I mentioned before we hopped on that I'm still unpacking um because my previous place where you stayed with me I was there for almost 12 years so this was like a very big move and I recently just found this shirt that my grandmother made me and it is an afghan that and it's one of the last things she made before she passed i'm gonna see if i can show you the back it's so cute it's like there's little ties down the back <laughs> but it's just a blanket that she cut up and put yarn sleeves on <laughs> and then a shoelace <laughs> and mailed it to me and you can pull it <laughs> off mm -hmm. <laughs> and i haven't seen it in a really long time and I just discovered it a couple of days ago when I was finally like opening up the boxes and bags that I just was like you're gonna live in the closet for a year um so Super it felt like cute. the right occasion to bust it out yeah but you always have great clothes and style thank you I mean I think I get it from her I think that's been a lot of my time too during the pandemic is like considering ancestral creativity right so we talk so much about ancestral trauma and what we pass down and what we break breaking the cycle but also thinking of the flip side like deprivation and trauma and survival of our ancestors and what kept them going and definitely sewing and making things and decorating kept my grandmother going um and making stuff out of nothing and I think even just moving to a new apartment, just all of those aspects of her, I see coming out. Yeah, how is that to decorate and create a new space for yourself after so many years of being in the it, other place? It took me a full year. I mean, it took me a really long time. Thankfully, I live in a very sweet space that has two cats that come to visit me, my landlord and the third floor, um, my friend who lives on the third floor. So that immediately made it feel like home. And I've never been a cat person, but now I'm a total cat lady. Mm. Yeah, so <laughs> hey. <laughs> and 
then the other cat is under the couch. Um, <laughs> but it's been it's been interesting because it's a lot smaller. It's a much smaller space, which I'm thankful for. Um, it's more affordable, but really having to get creative with space. Um, and I think also working with space while working from home. And I think that's been something that myself, others, clients, the challenges of carving out those different spaces so that you don't feel like all of my home is my work place. Um, so that's been something I've been thoughtful about. Like what's the kitchen? What's the living room? What side of the couch is the work side of the couch? Um, I'm not on the work side of the couch. No, that can absolutely help. That's another thing that's great about you. You have like your your wearing works of art, like you're always so creative with your dress and then the way you decorate your house is always full of art. And then your art itself, your art installations, maybe you can talk a little bit about them. Yeah. They're like actual pieces that often people can like crawl inside and sit in. And I always love like going into your installations because it was like, you know, there'd be like a party going on around in the house that it was in. And then when you crawl inside, it's like this little, I don't know, like meditative dreamland. It felt like you're just like going inside this like little nest or bubble. Mm -hmm. It's such, such a nice space you create. Thank you. Um, oh, that really means a lot. I also feel like it's interesting now because now more than ever, I'm seeing art shift a little bit and the concepts of art. And I'm seeing art and wellness come together more and I'm seeing more artists creating things not for super conceptual kind of out there um, untouchable art but also art that's actually made for others to feel peace or to feel mindful I don't know if you've been noticing that I've just been seeing this shift in what's kind of around in the art world and the art scene um, a piece of one of my installations is that mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, I have, and, and I also like haven't done really a lot of my work in a while. Um, but one of the last shows that I had was at La Bodega Gallery, which is now closed. It was such a beautiful community space here in South Slope, Brooklyn. Um, I believe they still have their social media apps. You should check them out. They still have um, figure drawing. Um, but it was a, such a community hub. And the last show I did, it was February, 2020. It was right before the pandemic hit was called Community. So what I did was um, like some of my installations in the past started a framework, created a framework of a partial tree. Um, and then I put out a whole bunch of different materials to choose from, usually a bunch of recyclables and upcycled materials. And what was a little bit different about this one is that I had a little bit of instructions. So I had instructions for um, just finding a way to breathe and ground and then set an intention for your year and not, it was supposed to be kind of coming into the new year. So not setting a resolution, but what is an intention and what's a compassionate intention for myself and others. And so the idea was that while you were adding on to the tree and weaving into the pieces that were there, you were also actively setting an intention while you were doing so. Um, so that was one of the last installations that I did. And it ended up being this wild, funky tree form. And I held a couple workshops there um, for families and for adults. And it was just so cool. It was such a kind of... It was a beautiful thing to happen before the world took a wild <laughs> turn of events. Um, but before that, a lot of my work was kind of making different huts and holding environments. And I think a lot of my work became more interactive and more participatory after I went to school for art therapy. Um, and a part of that was kind of just melding my world, kind of melding my identities a little bit more. I think my art had always been toggling that way, but I used to have installation that you could kind of walk around and see, but you couldn't really get in and interact with as much. And now most of my stuff is pretty interactive. Um, although as of lately, the past year, I've just been doing a lot of drawing. And I think that's based on 
conforming to my spaces. So having moved to a much smaller space and taking a while to get it set up, um, I moved into doing more drawing. I'm trying to see if I have, I have one. I have like this coloring page that says radical love and acceptance. And then I started making tarot cards, but not oh, cool. traditional tarot cards, actually tarot cards that share a feeling or intention for someone in my life. So tarot thank you cards. Um, I don't know where they are. Oh, here's one. This How one. cute. This one just goes out to every Latino, Latinx family using VIX to solve the world. Um, <laughs> other little things. This was a birthday present for Jason of last year. And it's actually, so you open it up and then you pull out these little tickets. And so one says one guilt-free ticket for up to 24 hours to while out, no expiration date. <laughs> <laughs> one free ticket to take a one day vacay from your worries. There is an expiration date on that one. Um, <laughs> and then just a blank permission slip. Unfortunately, this is a birthday present from last year that I never gave him. That's just been spinning in this <laughs> Just a good reminder. And his birthday just passed again, so. Yeah, so now I can <laughs> give it to him. But um, it really reminds me just how much space affects me, right? And like, so moving into a smaller space, moving at a time where it felt more burnt out ever, and then getting into drawing and coming into smaller. And I think needing a sense of control where I love my like bigger free form, wild upcycled objects, I think I needed the self-soothing and I needed the sense of control. So to work on a little card, it's like, whoo, everything's right here. I know where it is. I can do that. Yeah, I have, now that we've moved from the apartment to a house, now I have a table where I can leave all my cut-ups and my collage stuff out instead of when we were in the apartment, I would work on it like, you know, in, uh, on the living room table at the couch where we would eat and watch TV. It was like all one table for everything, <laughs> you know, right, and so I would have to work. like put it, I'd have to put it away every time, every day, mm -hmm. you know. And that impacts us. I think that impacts all areas, right? It impacts the spiritual energy of the place, of the table, of your work, right? When it's like toggling those different worlds. Um, trying to see what else. Oh, do you want to see some other things? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this is just, you know, ugh, it's everything. It's all of our life, but it's in watermelon. And then my favorite saying, woof. <laughs> This is just how I felt this past year. Got been life. Mm, this is a little Valentine that says all love is magic. And I feel like this is needed now more than ever. Kind of just in seeing the polarization of America and just seeing how gross and disgusting things have gotten. And also even thinking about something like Yesterday I was reading about the monkeypox and like the intense stigma. And I'm like, did we learn nothing from HIV and AIDS? No, we're gonna do it again. We're gonna do it again. We're gonna just stigmatize a disease. Okay. Uh, so I don't know. I feel like there's definitely been a part of me too, what the world, the things that feel so out of control to come in and draw and find that little piece of control. Um, also something we learn as art therapists is this expressive therapies continuum or the continuum spectrum of materials. So where something like a wet clay or wet paint is very like regressive and opening, something like a colored pencil and a pen actually offers you more sense of control and is more of a sense of kind of a ground up um, way, if that makes sense. And even like something like collage too can be like when you have all the pieces can feel really messy. And when you're just like cutting can feel very grounding and controlling. I don't know if you 
get that. Oh yeah. I go through phases with what I feel like I need to do. And like yeah. right now I've just decided <clears throat> that I have to reorganize all of my materials before I can work on anything else. Yeah. I get into that. And yeah. like I literally have a trunk of cut ups. And when I first started doing them, you know, I only cut up like basically people I knew, like my writing, Carl's writing, Jen's writing, yes. people I knew, and like people that I knew were like really magical. So I only had like very specific magical creative people in my cut up box. And then since then, I've cut up like more articles and just like random things in <laughs> newspapers and stuff. And that was okay for a while. But now I'm like, I don't want that material in it because I saw how like potent everything was when it was like really just like the source material was so potent yeah. and yeah. like Burroughs and Geisen always say you know you can cut up anything grab any magazine or whatever it'll always say yeah. something and it's true it does but I really it was just like it said so much more when when the source material was really potent so I've decided I have to like go through my huge trunk and like take out all the things also like when you cut up a newspaper or magazines there's a lot of like you know, crime and murder and stuff like that. And I think since there's been so much death this past couple of years, including murder, and it's just mm -hmm. like, I don't want that in my cut ups. I don't want it yeah. in my cut ups. Yeah. I, there's enough murder and crime and stuff in the world. I don't need it in my art. So mm -hmm. I feel like I want to like go and like pull all of those kinds of news stories out and get rid of them and just like go back to like only having texts that are like really creative, magical texts. Yes. Well, it carries the energy right yeah. like it's not even that the word has the impact it's the energy of the story of what brought the story of like and then that right and also thinking of cut-ups of being magical and being magic right so you're definitely it's hard to separate that energy if you cut it up from something that is that like harsh triggering material yeah it's true so that's my next thing. And then I decided I'm also going to, I have I have two trunks. I have one trunk full of words and then I have one trunk full of like images and magazines. And I've decided I'm also going to go through the magazines and like cut out pictures that I like and put them all in a box so that I have like a box of like image material ready. Because right yeah. now when I, when I feel like doing something, I just like grab magazines and stuff and I don't really look very carefully. I just like grab things that either fit the page or a different color scheme that I'm using or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I think instead of having to go through all these magazines, flip, 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 I could just like have a box of like source material. That might be fun. Um, yeah, and I like the idea of there not being a restriction. Like if that works for now, like if this feels good, this yeah, is- Yeah, it will change. Probably as soon right as now. I set all this up, then I'll decide to do it a different way. <laughs> yeah, but you needed that process, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you needed that process to get to that. And that also thinks, it makes me think of like, again, thinking of like how materials affect us. And I, I so I taught dynamics of materials at Pratt for the, um, a couple of years. So when we got to the collage section, um, first of all, I showed them some of your cutups um oh. but also yeah you were in some of my lesson plans um and then I also talked about the difference between offering a stack of magazines or offering pre-cut images the difference mm. between um categorizing your images right offering because I used to do sometimes I would have a collage group or um course and I would have like places people animals things and kind of have those categories and really tuning into personalizing it for the group, personalizing for the client. What do they need? Do they need to kind of look at a magazine and be able to have choice, right? Or is that overwhelming? Might that, might that be overwhelming and it might be good to have some structure and here's a box of images and it's in a nice container and I can kind of self-soothe and pick my images. Do we need to have a box of words? So really being thoughtful about it not like what the project is, but how do I prepare the materials that's person-centered? And also thinking about so many places I worked, the magazines didn't match my clients. Like I can't have magazines that are all white people and none of my clients are white. <laughs> like it didn't make any sense in so many places. I was like, this is horrendous. This is just like, 
not at all showing diversity. So really being thoughtful too of where am I sourcing my materials from? How are they relatable to the people that I'm working with? Or what do they want? Bring your own magazines in, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like collage is something that I started to put a lot more thought into. Um, and just a funny side note story that I would also tell my students as a cautionary tale. So I worked at a preschool um, with different, uh, with children with intellectual disabilities, autism spectrum, um, developmental disabilities, and I was there for about a few years. But when I first started, there was tons of materials in the art closet. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. I don't have to order. This is great. Um, and we were doing collage one day. So I just like picked the bag didn't look. I was like, great, they're pre-cut out for preschoolers. It's wonderful. Dumped the bag out in a little bin and off I went to push into the classroom. I would just like go classroom to classroom. Um, yeah, one of the one of the magazines or a couple that the previous art therapist used was High Times magazine. And I gave a box of collage materials that was all marijuana. <laughs> I thought it was nature. I thought it was all nature. But as I'm looking through, I'm like, that's a pot leaf. That's a marijuana plant. And then there was one, there must have been like a spread of dogs in marijuana because then there were pictures of dogs laying in pot leaves. <laughs> and I had to very quickly like alert the teachers so that I, I didn't send home a bunch of preschoolers with their weed collages. <laughs> But so you gotta look at the materials. <laughs> I mean, personally, I was like, "This is awesome," but I couldn't. I couldn't go doing that. that but it's funny. just something to be aware of, like what Only is the content. <laughs> it was amazing. I was like, "Who was the previous art person or art therapist here? Why did they sabotage me?" <laughs> We should talk about that too, though, because like when I worked at Woodhull, they, they had great art therapy programs in like the inpatient units, but of course these just kick, get cut and cut and cut. And it's like, you know, it's been shown so many times how helpful it is for basically anyone to have kind of access to creative materials. And it's such a great thing to have in inpatient units, but unfortunately the state just cuts it, you know? Yeah. So, and I also, I wrote a little article on LinkedIn and by wrote an article, like LinkedIn has a feature where it can be like, write an article. Um, and it's about just that. It's about um, the worth of art and the value of art. Um, and a part of what I was writing about was there is a bill coming up that will be the 12th year that it's coming up. And it's basically to offer blanket insurance coverage and creative arts therapists be a part of it. So there was recently a New York state bill that had also been vetoed for a decade. So just vetoed year after year after year. Um, that was for Medicaid coverage. So basically, um, if you are an independent practitioner, have your own art therapy practice, you can't bill Medicaid as an art therapist. So basically, right, so you can have your Medicaid and get art therapy services when you're in crisis, right? So like um, in a hospital, in inpatient, in partial hospitalization, in like intensive outpatient, in shelters, when you're really in crisis, you can receive art therapy. However, then art therapy is really quite hard to get if you're not in a crisis situation because we can't bill Medicaid. So it's really this kind of terrible messaging of like, you can get this service when you're down and out and then that's it. Or you better just get some real insurance and get some money so you can pay. It's just a total two different sides of the spectrum that doesn't make any sense and really closes the amount of access that people have to utilizing creative arts therapy. Um, and it also makes it so that if you are someone who's in private practice and you want to survive off of it, it really changes the type of clients that you're available to see. So that was vetoed in January. Um, I was a part of a campaign when I was 
on the board for New York Creative Arts Therapists as the chapter delegate and a part of a campaign for Cuomo to sign it in. He vetoed that um, in 2009, no, in 2020. Um, and then Kathy Holchel just vetoed. So basically, actually, it was very specific and it and it could relate, you, re, you could relate. So it was a bill that would allow for licensed marriage and family counselors, um, licensed mental health counselors, licensed creative arts therapists and psychoanalysts to bill Medicaid. Um, the bill was amended to take out psychoanalysts and creative arts therapists and passed for mm. licensed mental health counselors and for um, licensed marriage and family counselors. So basically, you know, the poor, they don't deserve an unconscious. They just don't, they don't get one. And that's actually something that um, is a quote. I'm gonna send it to you actually, so that you can have it. Cause it's a quote that I'm taking from one of your friends, actually. Patricia Jaramici. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes. Um, who writes psychoanalysis in El Barrio, which is the book that I recommended to so many of my students. Um, it's been used in my students' theses um, because there's a huge divide in what we, what when once we toggle into the arts, the work is like, no, we're gonna cut the arts programming. We're gonna, um, why, would, why would someone on Medicaid need art therapy or creative arts therapy or psychoanalysis? That's of the upper echelon of people, right? And it's just so bizarre and also really shows this kind of colonial point of view because when you think about the root of who are the communities and cultures that value the arts as healing, that value the arts um, or spirituality as a part of education, right? Those are largely indigenous cultures mm -hmm. um so it's a very clear divide of what's you know what's worth it or like thinking about schools losing art programming because it's not standardized you can't test um because the materials are too expensive and why do people need to make art <laughs> um i will send you a link to the article that i wrote about this Please because do. Also about um currently there is a bill that is I thought the decision was supposed to be made by July, but I guess I'm mistaken because nothing has come of it. Um, but that is the bill, I believe it's A1171. Um, and I will send you that info too. And that's for blanket insurance coverage. And that would cover licensed mental health counselors, licensed marriage and family counselors, psychoanalysis and licensed creative arts therapists to have blanket health insurance coverage. Um, which would be huge and should just be a given. And instead it's been vetoed for 12 years. Um, so that's something that right now has been, is really just waiting for the governor. Is It's at its final steps and she can pass it. Um, I did a lot of campaigning for it on social media. I also know that New York Creative Arts Therapist and one of the co-founders, Drina Fagan, did a lot of um, really good initiatives to get people to kind of write, fax, call, email. Um, let's get this passed because it's really unfortunate um, and really makes a very clear divide on what the worth for these, for different types of programming. What's the worth? And why can a psychologist, social worker bill and get, you know, it's just, there's a huge learning curve. There's just still a really huge learning curve and art therapies come a long way and creative arts therapy, but it's still not seen as the same and very far behind and psychoanalysis too. I mean, we're literally sitting in the same boat in the same bills getting vetoed. <laughs> um, I believe it. Yeah. <clears throat> So, but that's something that um, also when I'm thinking about open house and the continued ed programming is like bringing the art back in art therapy. Um, I think also, I think of like the open studio process, which Pat Allen um, and Deborah Block, who were um, some founding art therapists created was 
purposely to declinify and demedical model. Um, but I feel like I'm seeing things go the other as we're progressing. I'm seeing things go the other way, um, especially in certain areas. I think East Coast versus West Coast. I think New York City also is a much more medical model space. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it seems like, yeah, exactly. Like as we push forward in so many things and directions, there's like this kind of uh, defense or pullback in another way. It's like very polarized, you know? Like in some, some ways things are progressing so well, like with bringing more awareness to a lot of different social justice issues and things like that. And for like, you know, magical practices and stuff to be more yeah. in the mainstream and like, um, yeah. You know, I have the psychoanalysis art in the occult series where I read this book called The Lost Knowledge of the Imagination. And they they call it oh. they they say instead of <clears throat> that occult knowledge is is often, like you said, indigenous knowledge. And mm -hmm. it's it's knowledge that's been excluded. And I, I really like mm -hmm. that phrasing because it's it's been occulted. It's not just like hidden knowledge <laughs> for no reason, but it's yep. been consciously excluded. It's excluded knowledge. Um, but it is a form of knowledge in its own right. And these practices that have been excluded are like thousands and thousands of years older than the current paradigm. Um, yes. Yeah. Which totally relates to art therapy, right? Art therapy comes from a very Eurocentric medical, psychoanalytic, psycho psychotherapy background, like kind of its roots to it becoming a clinified field. But art therapy has been around since the dawn of time. Um, people utilizing the arts. And even I think about the materials class I was teaching, like making sure to kind of make that the bedrock of the knowledge. Um, but really talking about that, right? Like talking about creation and what's the appreciation. Um, and I try to kind of talk about that in the courses I was teaching, but I also want to have that as a part of my continued ed workshops, like continuing to utilize these materials and sure, let's make mandalas, but let's educate and bring some history and context to where these things have come from and how do we pay respect to these cultures. And I think of things like land recognition and, um, you know, so many talks I've seen where people give land recognition, which I think is really important, but then I'm like, well, what's next though? Like, I don't know, like right now we're on Lenape land, but I didn't give land recognition because I don't have any Lenape art or information to share about what's happening. Um, I don't know. So it's like a, I do feel like art therapy pulls from things that have been happening in history forever. And I do think that's coming to light more, but it's also like the systems that be that are quantifying and the arts will never fully be able to be quantified. Yeah, and art, you know, uh, the first kind of artworks were also very spiritual, right? Like people creating things that they utilized kind of to make sense of the world and to pay tribute yes. and to honor things. Um, and we put them in museums and people look at yeah. them and they're like, that's nice. But all of these things had like ritual purposes, you know, they were like um, interactive, like mm -hmm. your installations, like they were interactive. Art wasn't just like something you go to a gallery yeah. and look at. Yeah. It's something people created because of a certain drive to connect mm -hmm. in a certain way. Um, yeah, so it all fits together. And that obviously like had some sort of mental process that was needed at the mm -hmm. time as well. Um, so it's, it's really That's really the root of everything, of, of all culture. It's people creating art, ritual, artifacts. Um, yes. And that having some sort of, yeah, like a conscious effect on consciousness, you know? Yes. I think about, um, I think it's, I forget which book it is. I think it's Child Art Therapy. Judith Rubin, who's a pioneer art therapist um, in the beginning of the book, talks about the cave painting. It was like, people needed to communicate. We need it. They needed to share and communicate. Um, and this has been happening. Um, since the beginning, right? And so like the different ways that we commodify things and actually if we think about 
you know, what were those people trying to do? They were communicating with one another um, or they were communicating from within, right? Yeah, when I, I was recently in France uh, for a wedding that was rescheduled from before COVID uh, started, because COVID is still happening. Um, and uh, <laughs> when we were there, uh, we were in the Southwest of France and we got to go to um, see some caves that had, they weren't paintings, but they were more like etched, etched into the rock. And uh, they said the, the etchings were uh, 30 to 35,000 years old. And that people had been living in that cave system for approximately 80,000 years. It was just mind, blo mind blowing. It was amazing to see. Mm -hmm. did you I feel like that has be, like bodily feeling yeah no it was intense cave. it was like going into this womb because they have it they had the the entrance it was like a natural cave which was why it was so uh, uh hospitable for people to live in and it had like at the peak of the cave there was like a little hole that was naturally there so people could have a fire and have the smoke go out mm. and it even had like formations where like the center was kind of a bigger room and then there was these kind of like side like little cubbies off of the center and they said we assume that's like where people slept you know so it was like kind of like yeah it's like a home made in this kind of rock um but they had closed in the the original entrance to protect it from the light you know so that the the etchings would be protected to, from the light and the air and I guess animals and things mm -hmm. so you when you went and it was like totally dark and then they just would turn on a flashlight to show you like each each one and it was yeah it was really amazing actually it was very very cool that sounds amazing the illumination of it yeah from the dark to the it light was very cool was there anything else that you wanted to mention that we didn't get to let me think I wrote a little piece of scrap paper around here where I wrote a bunch of stuff but I think that we talked about it the New York bills open house the worth of art gatekeeping <laughs> these are the things that I have written down burnout <laughs> mm -hmm. um yeah that is I mean it's so funny that I feel like I mentioned gatekeeping a lot because I feel like through, I've been in the field, I've been in this work for like about 14 years and I feel like my mind has changed so much through this time. And I think the pandemic has brought a lot of that change about and all I wanna do is share my information. I, you know, and I think there's also this push pull between the fields, right? Because, you know, we're getting denied um, access to, people who are Medicaid, blank insurance, all these things that we don't really quite fit into yet. Um, and at the same time, I'm like, I don't want us to do the same practice in creative arts therapy. So I know that a lot of people are like, not a lot, there's a, a I feel like a section of creative arts therapists who are very protective about the work and I get that. And I feel like I used to really feel that way. And now I see different ads for certificate programs and people are really kind of up in arms about it. And I went to school for my degree and I have, and I'm like, let people get their certificates, be a social worker, go to school and actually be able to pay for it, not have $300,000 in loans and then get to utilize creative arts. Like, so a lot of, you know, one thing that I've been doing recently is I still get a lot of people that reach out to me via DM, email, wherever, um, asking me about art therapy and asking me about going to school for art therapy. And honestly, I've kind of switched gears through the past couple of years. And I'm just like, research the cheapest degree. Research <laughs> where you can go. Can you get a social work degree and learn the clinical piece and then also be taking art courses and really enriching your creativity and figuring out a way to utilize your creativity? So not to take away from art therapists and not to say that someone can just open up shop and call themselves an art therapist because you can't, it's, it's a field, you have to get training, you have 1500 hours post-graduation training, you have your exam and all of that. But I think I'm really right now just wanting us to open up and like hold each other more and hold each other 
if we're all in this mental health mess together, <laughs> um, how can we work together in these fields? And I feel like I've definitely shifted gears and I feel like people can go to school for one field, but still utilize the creative arts in their practice and in their work. And it doesn't have to mean that they're stealing our jobs or our titles. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. But I it feel like makes that's total sense. Definitely and again, it's about. I think that's what happens a lot though with the, the systems and power well, is that it's really it's us. really a <laughs> systemic issue, right? Why aren't these fields covered? Why aren't they given the recognition they deserve? You know, why can't people get access to this? But then instead of people looking at that, it turns more into an infighting thing where they say, oh, well, this person's not as qualified because they went this route and that, you know, but it's not really about that. It's really about changing the system. That's what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And that I think, I think especially with mental health fields, but in probably in lots of fields, everybody has such different routes to get to where they end up and they all end up like winding in their various ways but those kind of different routes is what makes your experience unique and then also Mm -hmm. gives you kind of unique skill set um that usually you know is is founded off of what you have kind of naturally and Mm -hmm. you know yeah they should all be celebrated I don't I I I don't have a very competitive spirit at all in that way because I've never found it to be the case that like you know you taking this takes it away from me in my experience it's like oh we all share share resources try to support each other and whatever each of us feels driven to do and then we all end up doing better in the end (laughs) you know that's my experience is that we can all like lift up and support each other in what we're doing rather than trying to nitpick and tear tear each other down well that's what capitalism wants us to do right like that's what the systems want us to do and that's how it keeps people down and I think even this podcast like rendering the unconscious and all the work that you've been doing is just that is a literally like let me bring all the different types of thoughts and ideas and share and inform one another and promote one another. And I think that's so special with the work. And I think it's so inspiring. And I think I always kind of continue to look at your work at like this inspiring in being able to integrate like your passions, your education, your like, so your arts, your psychology, like all the things, um, and I, and I'm hoping for, and I think I'm seeing even some shifts in the art world that way, like seeing things like I, um, I was doing a small series with Dia Beacon, their Chelsea location. Um, and it was an art series and I can give you the information so you can share that because the artist was incredible. Um, and it was an art series and all of it was really based in arts wellness, compassion, um, the LGBTQ community, um, access, inclusion. And it was at Zia Beacon, like a very kind of usually minimal art institute. And it was just so cool. I'm like, oh, there things are changing. Things are moving a little bit. Um, and I was just there as an art therapist in case anyone was triggered by the content or was feeling Um, They needed a respite from the workshop or just wanted resources. Um, And it was the first time I'd ever did anything like that, like partnering with an art institution in that way. And I was like, ooh, this is a good sign. Um, That's that's great. Yeah. Very cool. Well, how do people get in touch with you and are able to donate to Open House to help Open House continuing education come to fruition? Yes. Um, so you can get in touch with me. Um, so on Instagram, I'm M underscore Diaz underscore art. Um, open house is open house BK. Um, my Venmo is open underscore house underscore BK. Um, I also have, if you go on Instagram to the open house page, I have a link to a PayPal fundraiser um, in the bio. Um, yeah. And I think those are all the different avenues. Um, and I so appreciate this getting to sit down four years, four years later, 
Right. It's been a while. I remember when you came on before Parkland had just happened because you went to Parkland. Oh my gosh. So I, I think that was 2017 or something. 2018, oh. maybe. You know what? These pandemic years, they haven't, they've changed time. Time is all just, nothing's linear anymore. It doesn't feel right. But um, it's so cool to be back. And I'm so thankful for you. And I'm thankful for you having me back and for the work that you do. Um, yeah. So I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for being here. And come back again Anytime. and tell us updates. I will. I would love to.